Thank you very much for organizing. This is so great to be here at uh, a face-to-face -face meeting. We're all sick of those uh, uh, virtual meetings and uh, fantastic to see everyone in this room. So I do have a conflict of interest. I'll be mentioning some products that I've either been involved in developing or I act as a scientific advisor to some of these companies. One of the issues that we're facing with that infection is on the rise, and it's on the rise for multiple reasons, one of the most important one being that we're now paying more attention to infection, and hence we're discovering more of those. And second is that the infection is now getting attention of the young men and women in our orthopedic community, and as you can see, more and more of these uh, research publications are coming out of institutions related to infection. One of the things that I I think we need to be very careful about is that there have been a lot of so-called perceived uh, wisdom that's been handed down to us from the old days, and I think many of them now need to be re-examined because many of them are probably not correct. And in light of emerging evidence in other fields of science, and particularly in surgical fields, we need to start to re-examine them because then that will allow us to actually approach this problem from a different perspective. We know that infection carries high morbidity, and it leads to loss of limb, and sometimes to loss of lives. Infection carries actually five-year mortality rate that's very similar to some of these common cancers. You've seen us and others publishing on it. A very interesting study just came out of the Swedish registry showing that the five-year survivorship of periposthetic joint infection is worse than breast cancer and paralleling that of pancreatic cancer. So infection is a deadly condition to develop, and it's something that we really owe to our patients to try to do as much scientific work on this ground as we can, because much of the things we do today is based on thin science, if any at all. And that was the reason why we had the international consensus meeting, two of them, to try to come up with areas to standardize care and also identify the scientific uh, uh, need of the community in terms of doing research. That document is available on this app, and some of the things I will be talking to you about is actually directly from that international consensus meeting. So what have we done on the prevention side? Well, we're actually looking at infection now from a totally different viewpoint. At least the others are. Maybe we're not in orthopedics, but a lot of other surgical fields are looking at infection as a condition that is actually is caused by issues like microbiome, the immunity of the host, and the interaction of these organisms with our body at a given time. And there is some research emerging showing that osteoarthritis perhaps in itself is a condition caused by an infection. Don't laugh at that concept because we did the same when uh, Barry Marshall and Warren Robin uh, in 1984 suggested that Helicobacter pylori causes gastric ulcer. 20 years later, they received the Nobel Prize for their work. So microbiome is a subject that's gaining huge attention. We live in an ocean of organisms. For every given cell in our body, there is three or four microbes. And for the most part, we live in harmony with these microbes and no issues arise. Examples of these abound in nature. Herodotus described the story of Trochilus, the commensalism, plover flying into the mouth of a crocodile, picking on the parasites, but the crocodile knows not to close the mouth until the plover is done with the job. And Heinrich Anton de Barry called this the symbiosis, and we know about symbiosis existing in nature in every aspect of our lives. But when that equilibrium between the microbiome and our body and the cells gets disrupted, state of dysbiosis arises, which then leads to diseases. Are there diseases caused by dysbiosis? Oh, you bet. There is science, nature, PNAS, cell. There's not a single month that goes by when a yet another disease is being described being caused by a state of dysbiosis. These are some that I've just picked from those four highly reputable scientific journals that describe the state of dysbiosis leading to disease. Our joints also have a distinct microbiome. Shoulder does, hip does, knee does, our CSF does. We don't actually live without microbes. Microbes are everywhere in our body. And this is a heat wave map. I know this is very confusing. 
This is osteoarthritic hips and knees. We've taken the samples from these and then done next generation sequencing, looking for the DNA signature of microbes. And these are the microbes that live usually in our joints that are arthritic. Now we're doing the work on the non-arthritic joints and to see if the non-arthritic joint also has a distinct microbiome. And if I were to guess, I will tell you absolutely it does. Now, interestingly, when you inject a joint, you change the microbiome profile of that joint. And here is the injected joints. And look at how the heat wave looks different in these patients than those that didn't have an injection. Osteoarthritis, microbiome, Leave, uh, leading to disease? Yes, this is the scientific proposal that's now being investigated to see if degradation of extracellular matrix could potentially be caused by microbes in the joint or potentially arriving in the joint from a leaky gut. So now the concept of leaky gut and how that can lead to various uh, diseases is being investigated. The Trojan horse theory. Organisms don't just fall in the wound, they can arrive in the wound being carried by macrophages or neutrophils. Staph aureus hitches a ride inside a macrophage or a neutrophil and comes to the site and causes infection. These are some of the works of my PhD student that we're looking at very carefully right now in PJI patients. The level of zonulin, which is an enzyme that actually mediates the gut, is excessively elevated. Is it possible that some of these patients are having um, bacteremia and other problems as a result of dysbiosis? It is possible. If that were the case, the days of metal and plastic may be numbered. If we get to a point where what they did with inflammatory arthropathy. How many patients do you see with rheumatoid arthritis needing hips and knees today? Disease-modifying agents change that game extensively. Please be aware that could also happen to osteoarthritis, degenerative disc disease, rotator cuff tear, Achilles tendonitis, ankle arthritis. All of these are now being investigated heavily by scientists trying to look for other methods of trying to prevent the disease in the first place, but more importantly, preventing infection. This is a great work by Michael Otto, amazing scientist from the NIH, published this work in Nature. He showed that administration of a bacillus, which is a probiotic, to volunteers in Thailand eliminated every pathogen in the gut of these patients. Published in Nature, incredible scientific work so does this mean that we could potentially be thinking about probiotics, prebiotics, immune modulation of patients before they undergo surgery? Yes, absolutely. Here's a list of uh, pa uh, patient optimizations that we do in order to try to reduce infection. These efforts are all trying to reduce the bio burden and or increase the immune threshold of the host, and hence trying to prevent a clinically manifested infection from arising. The most important work that everybody's aware of is obviously the influence of hyperglycemia, uncontrolled diabetes in causing infection. That was discussed during the consensus. How do we decide a patient is hyperglycemic? What markers do we use? Well, hemoglobin A1C is around. It's been used for a long time. And Bill Geranek, when he was the president, tasked us in the ARCUS research group to come up with a threshold for, a, uh, for hemoglobin A1C. And based on the work from numerous organizations and institutions, we found that the threshold for hemoglobin A1C is around 7.7 to 8 percent. My institution, we won't do elective arthroplasty on anybody who has a hemoglobin A1C of 8 or above. Then we subject them to optimization. Is that a good process? Yeah, absolutely. An interesting and important process because it does prevent or reduce the chances of infection. So it's also endorsed. Other areas, reduce skin, uh, prep, uh, skin bio burden in these patients by application of some sort of an antiseptic soap or some sort of a wipe. You can use chlorhexidine, you can use other wipes that are available, and you, it's been shown that these are very effective in eliminating the bacteria at the site of surgery. Now, we're working on a new marker called glycated albumin. Hemoglobin A1C takes 120 days, Japanese scientists have come up with a concept called glycated albumin, 
look at the glycation of albumin. Albumin has a short half-life of about uh, two weeks, and this can potentially replace the hemoglobin A1C and possibly fructosamine that we've talked about in the past also. We're going to have to move away from antibiotics. Antibiotics have very limited application in our world today, and they are re leading to emergence of antimicrobial resistance, which could result in obviously a devastating consequences on the society. Surface modification has been worked on for a long time, and now with the lowering of the bar at the agency, the FDA, it is possible that many of these surface modification technologies will find their way into our field. Here is the dragonfly's wing, it has a special type of nanotubules that prevents the bacteria from tethering to that surface. I know of two companies that are currently working on this nanotubule surface modification that has been very effective in prevention of bacterial adhesion to the surface and could potentially have a promising role in orthopedics, particularly with uncemented uh, material that we use. On the diagnosis side, we're going to have to do better. None of the tests that are being used today have been really developed with that purpose alone. Academy came up with fantastic recommendations, which I know most of you are aware of. There is an algorithmic approach to infection. Please note that this algorithm doesn't talk about bone scan, doesn't talk about MRI. It talks about ESR, CRP, and then aspirate the joint. And if the aspiration is dry, then re-aspirate the joint. It's amazing how many patients come to my institution. They've had none of this done, but they have had multiple bone scans. There is no role for doing bone scan for diagnosis of infection. I know that for sure, and I can, I can debate that with anybody who feels there is a role for the use of bone scan. Abandon doing expensive tests, just aspirate the joint. That's all we need. Whether you're a believer in biomarkers or not, doesn't matter, the field is moving in that field. It has provided some promises for us. I, I am obviously biased, but I use leukocyte esterase, this very, very cheap test on a daily basis. But I do believe we'll be moving towards biomarkers in the future. We might even be detecting bacteria from the serum and not the synovial fluid. That's being done in other fields of medicine currently. There are many of those, and I'm not conflicted. None of these I'm working on. None of these I'm familiar with personally. But I, I have been following the detection of bacteria from the serum, which could have a promising uh, role for diagnosis of infection in our patients. You probably saw this great work from HSS recently showing that you could see the microbial DNA in the serum of some of these patients with periprosthetic joint infection. Sure, this was a preliminary study. Sure, the numbers are very small, but I think this is the right direction to move towards. We should be moving towards isolation of organisms from the serum of these patients, if at all possible. This is fantastic work being done at MIT, use of microfluidics for diagnosis of infection. Fascinating work already being applied in many fields of medicine, and I do believe that these type of technologies will find their way into orthopedics, will change the game in how we're doing primitive work trying to diagnose infections. Gold standards, no gold standards exist because there's no absolute test for diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection, and that's why diagnostic criteria have been come up in the past. Recently, the 2018 diagnostic criteria was introduced. This was actually evidence-based and validated an outside cohort. We used pretest probability. What we found was three things. First of all, not all tests carry the same diagnostic weight. I'll tell you the best test is neutrophil count in synovial fluid. Now, there are re reports showing that that's as good as, if not better than alpha defensin. So that's not the same as ESR. ESR and neutrophil count in synovial fluid carry different diagnostic weight. That's why ESR gets a score of one, and neutrophil number gets a score of three. And by the way, the alpha defensin is here, but it doesn't mean that if you have alpha defensin that's elevated and cell count is elevated, that's not a score of six. It is either or. So you don't need an alpha defensin test if you already have the cell count from the synovial fluid of that patient. The second thing that came out is that there are ways to diagnose infection prior to surgery. With the MSIS criteria, unless they had a sinus tract, 
you couldn't make that diagnosis until you were in the operating room because many of the minor criteria had to be performed inside the operating room. But now with the 2018 diagnostic criteria, you're able to make that diagnosis preoperatively. And then the third thing that the 2018 diagnostic criteria discovered, and I'm sure every single one of you in this room will have an example of, is that there are circumstances of patients who miss the MSIS criteria, but you know for sure that they're infected. And in fact, if you look at the paper of the MSIS criteria, when we wrote it in the beginning, we said that there are some organisms, such as C. acne, that may flow under the radar because it doesn't cause enough of these physiological response and hence may miss the diagnostic criteria. Well, that list seems like it's expanding. Coag negative staph can do it. Burkholderi sapaci can do it. And there are some atypical organisms that can be there causing the infection, but they will miss the MSIS criteria. Now, with the 2018, you are likely to detect at least 20% of those MSIS miss criteria and capture them using the diagnostic uh, thresholds. And you don't have to remember the numbers. You can download this app, and in this app, there is that PJIDX. That, that is the one that will guide you through the algorithm. In the middle, there's that PJI risk. That will tell you the risk of your patient for developing infection following surgery. And now we actually have what's called the DARE calculator. Patient in whom that you don't know whether you should be doing an IND or not doing an IND, that DARE calculator that came from Europe and from uh, 16 countries contributing data to, looks like it could help you. Recently, EBGIS, this is the European Bone and Joint Infection Society, published their diagnostic criteria, and the editor of this particular journal was very kind with his words um, and he insulted the entire community in the United States by telling us that we didn't know what we were doing up to today, and this will be the movement moving forward. But there are a few issues with the EBGIS definition. First of all, it doesn't even have ESR. It doesn't make a distinction between acute and chronic. Cell threshold, we know for acute, is extremely high based on work of Craig Della Valle and Tom Ferring and others. And here they're choosing a cell count of 1,500. And then we have actually then subjected this particular diagnostic criteria to study at Rothman, showing that EBGIS criteria can diagnose infection when there is definitely no infection and can miss an infection when there definitely is an infection. So I don't really believe that EBGIS criteria do have any role in uh, diagnostic criteria at the moment. I do feel that we'll be moving for better diagnostic methods in the future including use of synovial fluid that I mentioned to you, making distinction between different conditions that cause different types of physiological response. We all know about ALTR, but there may be other conditions that are causing similar issues which we are not aware of. We, I, we will move towards serum markers. ORF was kind enough to give us a grant where we explored numerous serum markers, and a few of those in green are potentially uh, very valuable. Chinese just published a paper showing that, um, that uh, fibrinogen is a great marker, serum marker, as a, as a screening test, similar to the D-dimer. There will be others that will come through, and I do believe that ESR and CRP will probably be replaced by tests that are much better than what we have today. But in, in coming to the end of my talk, I want to leave you with some thoughts about culture and what culture has done to us in terms of moving us in the directions that perhaps has not been right. Culture was a fantastic technology in 1886. Obviously, has played an amazing role, but this is what 1880s were. This is the car we used to drive. This was a telescope, and this is what we were using to isolate organisms. This is today. This is what we use. We're still using that technology. So I do feel that the future is going to have to be different than culture. Again, I'm conflicted because I work with companies looking for microbial DNA, and they're working on other types of molecular techniques. I'm pretty sure that next generation sequencing with further refinements could be one of those technologies that will help us. With NGS, you don't need to know what organism you're looking for in order to isolate them. With PCR, you need to know the organism before you can find them. You have to design the primer towards that microbe. 
And you can't really isolate more than 20 microbes at max with PCR. With NGS, you can isolate up to 50,000 organisms if you want. I'll tell you another very, very sobering fact. Of all the microbes that live in our bodies, only 1% of them are culturable. Yes, only 1% of organisms that live in our body are culturable. So culture is a very primitive technique. It's got to go away with time, and I think it will change. Here's an example of a 14-year-old boy in coma, gets admitted to Wisconsin hospital. Everything done to try to isolate his uh, organism fails. They even did a brain biopsy, and everything came back as negative. NGS isolates leptospirosis. And uh, NASA uses this technology to try to isolate organisms. We're now seeing unbelievable organisms that are being released as the iceberg is, being, uh, uh, iceberg is melting from millions of years ago. So the microbes that we're getting exposed to are more and more, and we're recognizing more and more of these microbes. The multi-center study that was sponsored by Microgen DX and finished the analysis on 2,000 patients just recently found that at least 90% of these culture-negative cases, you could isolate the organism using NGS. Not 100% of the time, but I think 90% is good. We're in 21st century. You're putting a patient through two operations. You're telling them, I'm going to give you six weeks of intravenous antibiotics. You come back, and we're going to put new implants in, in two months. During this time, you'll be functionless. You will not be able to go to work, etc. You come back, and there's a still 20% chance you're going to fail later. Couldn't the patient ask, how do you know what antibiotic to give me if you don't even know the organism? Fair question. 21st century, that has to have an answer. You, we must know what we're dealing with before we put these patients through them. So it's good you can use synovial fluid also. What we've also found is that when you do send your samples for next generation sequencing, you will get a whole host of organisms, some of which you've never heard of. And you're going to, your first reaction is going to be, I don't think this means anything. I am not familiar with this at all. Yes, you're not, because culture used to give you one organism, Staph aureus, wouldn't tell you what else is in there. But later, your patient would fail with E. coli, and you would then call it a reinfection. But what if that E. coli was there in the first place and the culture didn't pick it up? In fact, that is the case. That's exactly what's going on. So the list of organisms here, Majority of them you could treat with single antibiotics, but a second one could potentially miss that antibiotic and come back and cause a reinfection. So we need to combine the analytical data with clinical data. And in a case like that, which um, you're seeing multiple organisms, E. coli is there. The signature of E. coli is there. The question is, do we need to treat that or not? Now, we're about to start a randomized prospective study where patients will be treated based on NGS results and versus culture. If we are right, and if NGS is better than culture, you should see a better failure rate in the NGS group versus culture. So this polymicrobial concept is something I've believed in for a long time, and now we're beginning to see more and more evidence that majority of the infections we deal with are caused by multiple organisms. Only one of them is the dominant one orchestrating the whole thing and gets picked up by culture. The rest get ignored, and they can come back at a later date and cause reinfection. Your antibiotic may cover majority of them by single, but there could be another one that you need to administer in these patients to try to prevent them. Bonnie Bassler is a great microbiologist from Princeton. Very likely she'll win the Nobel Prize at some point. She talks about polymicrobial organisms and how this whole thing gets orchestrated uh, together. And organisms always live in communities like we do in our societies. You can't have just the Staph aureus. There are so many of the others, and your culture is just picking up Staph aureus because that's what they were looking for. So we have signals showing that when you ignore that organism, it comes back and causes a reinfection at a later date. Cost of sequencing has uh, really dramatically declined over the last few years. Human Genome Project, that took 13 years at $3 billion, can be done in a day at a cost of actually $100 now. It's, it keeps going down. The two societies that really earned their living from doing culture have given us the message, clearly. 
American Society for Microbiology, American Academy of Microbiology, they've said that next generation sequencing has the potential to dramatically revolutionize the clinical microbiology laboratory by replacing time consuming, and I will add, inaccurate and labor intensive technique with a single all inclusive technology in the future. Whether it'll be metagenomics, next generation sequencing, something else, I do think the future is going to be molecular techniques. But don't forget that our, I just told you earlier that our joints are filled with DNA of microbes. So how do you then make a distinction between something that's part of the microbiome, part of your commensals in the joint, and those causing the infection? That's where I think the role of my, uh, the molecular marker, markers and other things will come in. And this, uh, that's when diagnostic criteria needs to be taken into account and the likelihood of infection using AI-based softwares where an analytical data will have to be combined to tell you the likelihood of an infection in a given scenario. So something like this, high probability of infection, take note, treat this patient, low probability of infection, potentially you could ignore. And we, I don't think we can rely on culture solely to guide our treatment for these patients. Talking of treatment, we've all been very, very stuck on our ways of doing two-stage reimplantation. Many authorities in the past 10 or 15 years that I've listened to, they would stand on the podium and say there is absolutely no other way than two-stage implantation for these patients. That doesn't happen to be true anymore. We're moving away from two-stage exchange arthroplasty. There are many reports of one-stage exchange arthroplasty working well. Irrigation and debridement still has a very high failure rates as you've seen. But one thing that came out of the uh, international consensus was that maybe irrigation debridement is technique dependent. Maybe we need to do repeat IND, like Tom Ferring is doing a prospective study right now in North Carolina uh, based on um, Mike Spangel's work from Mayo at uh, Scottsdale that showed repeat IND has better outcome. Perhaps it does. So Tom will tell us after this prospective study is finished. There is also this uh, whole concept that we need to do chemical and mechanical debridement because biofilm is really very established. And because of that, various things, and I think Bo showed this to you, and I'm extremely conflicted, but we need chemical forms of and, uh, biofilm debridement. The one stage exchange is obviously being um, embraced in Europe much more than here in China. Xiao Li does nothing but one, one stage with fantastic results. Tom Faring again should be congratulated for running this prospective study that will give us the answer. The UK, Steve Jones uh, is coordinating another study in the United Kingdom, and we have a lot of patients in one stage versus two stage. I do feel that there's going to be a real role for one stage, and in my opinion, about 80 to 90 percent of the infections we deal with today could be treated by one stage exchange arthroplasty. We don't need to put these patients through it. And the one stage exchange, Obviously, Endoclinic, here's my good friend, um, uh, Thorsten Gerke. They have their own uh, inclusion criteria, but I believe, again, Tom's study will tell us what the inclusion criteria should be. Two-stage exchanges still needs to be done with some of these patients, extremely bad soft tissues. We need, just need to make sure we do really good chemical and uh, mechanical debridement. But for us to say two-stage exchange is the gold standard, I don't believe that's the case anymore. It isn't. It is a barbaric solution to a problem that could be solved in different ways. What we do to our patients today doesn't work in 20, 30 percent of the time. It's unacceptable. If you tell a breast cancer survivor you have a five-year survivorship of 70 percent, they will certainly go to another uh, center seeking treatment. We are saying that to our patients on a daily basis. We must do better. Future must be different. What we do doesn't work. And it's up to you, young, and, um, young men and women in this room, to seek novel therapeutics. We need to do biofilm disruptions. We need to look for nature to fight nature. Perhaps we need to embrace things like look then and other enzymes for treatment. Perhaps these type of technology will be the future. And what we need to do is target those organisms that hide inside the cells. We need to perhaps think about pre or probiotics or other types of immune modulations. And we definitely need to seek other types of treatments, such as phage. I have had experience with this, and I was in Europe last week. Tristan Ferry from France is in the middle of doing a randomized prospective study using phage and license versus 
traditional antibiotics, their initial results are absolutely incredible. So phage, for those of you who don't know, and I will close with this, is a very interesting technology in which, if you could play the video, for some reason doesn't play, uh, phage are enzymes. They target specific bacterium, and they will come in and attach themselves to the actual wall of the uh, bacteria. Is the video playing? Yeah. They will come in, and they'll attach themselves to the cell wall of the bacterium, inject their DNA into the cell, DNA reassembles, phages then uh, uh, secrete enzymes called lysins, and the lysins will destroy the cell wall and the bacterium will be destroyed. This is an old technology, 1915, British military were using it. It has stayed actually very scientifically, uh, very vigorously in countries like Georgia, Poland, Russia, they still continue to use phage therapy. And I'm glad to see that microbiologists are now teaching phage therapy. My daughter is at college, and one of her projects is to design a specific phage to attack a mycobacterium. These are the ways we've got to seek alternatives. We can't continue to give antibiotics to patients, expect a different result. Future will be different. Thank you very much, and I'll stop here. Great presentation, as always. Thank you, Jay. Question. Um, your concept of microbiome, and what do you think is the impact of steroid injection for osteoarthritis, of disrupting that microbiome and maybe contributing not just to infections at three to six months, but long term? Yeah. Very great question, Stefan. Uh, so this, pay, uh, this uh, small group of uh, data we have uh, that analyzed shows that inje injection overall, steroid or viscous supplementation, changed the microbiome profile. Steroid in particular changed the microbiome profile towards what you would consider being more pathogenic. So I know the signal is still conflicting. Some people believe that injection increases the rate of infection. Some people it doesn't. Some people say you have to wait six weeks, three months, et cetera. What would be interesting would be to look to see, one, does the profile of the organism in the joint change with the administration of steroids? And two, when does that profile come back to normal? And that per could perhaps give us uh, an answer to that question of how long do you wait between the steroid injection and the, uh, and the surgical treatment. Steroid injections work. Our patients benefit from it, something that we've been using for decades. And I do believe it's still a great, great uh, treatment modality. But we have to be aware that by administration of anything like that, you change the profile of the microbiome then you have to do something to try to counterbalance that and perhaps reduce the risk of infection. What could that be? Probiotics. I think that's actually a very interesting area. Again, I'm not conf uh, conflicted. I, have no, I don't even know what they are at the moment. But I do believe that we've got to really try to modulate the immune system of our host before we do that. Oral steroids, by the way, Stefan, do the same. So patients, like my PhD student right now published a paper in scientific reports that shows Inflammatory bowel disease increases the rate of periprosthetic joint infection. That's not new to anybody in this room. We all know that. But we've all assumed that's probably because they are on a lot of immune modulating agents, etc. No. Inflammatory bowel disease causes a huge rush of bacteria into the gut under physiological duress of that patient during surgery, which can then translate to organisms at the site of the surgery which can then cause the infection. So stuff like that is something, this is all thinking outside the box. And the young men and women in this room, they've got to start to think differently than just blaming the steroid or blaming this agent or that agent. So oral steroids do the same. Jay, related to that, um, so how, how good is the data on the probiotics and do you have any recommend, do you do anything for your patients right now preoperatively yeah, to so, potentially address that. Great question, Tim. Uh, Michael Otto is the person who did that beautiful nature paper, and he does mouse model. The bacillus is the one that he developed. So he, and again, there's no financial conflict here. Michael sent us the bacillus in a powder form. We then made tablets out of those, and now we're just in the middle of a randomized prospective study given Michael Otto's bacillus to our patients pre-op, 
and versus placebo that looks exactly the same. Now, if we're looking for infection, we probably have to go for another 10 years. What we, were, we are doing is actually looking at some of these inflammatory markers, like zonulin, like CCS14, or some of these b proxies of seeing whether administration of probiotic made a difference to the immune threshold of the host or not. I, don't, I think it's an amazing science. There's a lot going on in this field, and just like anything else, there's a lot of witchcraft as well. So I wouldn't go and pick up a probiotic, you know, off the shelf and administer it to the patient. I think this needs to be evaluated scientifically by people like Michael Otto, and then tell us which of these we need to administer. Interesting that bacillus that Michael Otto has developed is also the bacillus that's in abundance in natural yogurt. The natural yogurt is really rich in that particular bacillus. And so it could be something like that. You know, some change in the nutritional uh, stats of the patient pre-op and perhaps post-op that could make a difference to their infection rate or wound healing. So Jay, we're, uh, you and I are both uh, sort of the t uh, longer ends of our career. Um, neither one of us have seen uh, the infection rates decline, uh, and in fact, as you alluded to, probably more the awareness seen uh, in some instances actually those increase. We're at an inflection point with computer learning, um, information, some of the stuff that you just shared with us, and, and it seems logical that we're going to be able to kind of start processing these sort of multiple variables and these equations and trying to solve some of this. If you go on a limb today and said, Ari, when is or my question to you is when is it uh, in the future? How far into the future before we're able to cut infection rates fifty percent? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I agree with you, by the way, but you and I have actually seen the infection rate even go up. Part of it is because we're paying more attention, which is really great. You know, when I used to give uh, talks on infection twenty years ago, you and I were doing research twenty years ago on infection. The room would have probably three or four, and I used to people. I used to always take it personally but I can see that why they wouldn't want to come and listen to an infection topic, right? Now it's much, much more appealing because it's something we see on, uh, all the time. We to answer your question... We solve, we solve I, some of the other problems, too. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, honestly, it's going to be in the next five to ten years. There are some fantastic scientists. I know one at Harvard, a group of scientists, are working on that exact thing that you just talked about, we have that risk calculator. We looked at 200 variables. They reached out to us and said, but there are thousands of variables. I said, I know, but we, well, first of all, we don't have those in the database, and secondly, we don't even know what to do with them. Right. So there, hopefully, is people like that will take the data from you and I and from everybody else from here, combine those together, come up with some sort of a software algorithm that will give us the likelihood of infection in the patient, but more importantly, will tell us which of those variables we need to address. I mean, no good if I come to you and say your patient has 17% risk of infection, uh, you still have to do an elective arthroplasty on that patient at some point. Which of those variables should you change? Some are changeable, modifiable, some are not. I think that that will happen. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Let me ask you that. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's two parts to that. Uh, one is, you know, how do you prevent it? Um, so that's part of cutting that, uh, that, that, that burden down. And the other is sort of what do you solve? How do you solve it? And, 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 and you know, I don't think we solve it by uh, – it's, it's not with our antibiotics. It's some novel technology that uh, maybe you're thinking about, maybe some of these people are thinking about, but that we're not currently using. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it is, you know, turning, turning the beast on itself, in, in, in other words. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Let me just uh, bring it down to more basic level, but we're talking about novel technologies and patient analysis preoperatively. And uh, sometimes I think we like to blame things on the patient, you know. To me, after long uh, 40 years of experience doing surgery, one of the most important things is just draping the patient. And then the other thing is that if I look at infections I've had, there's a large percentage are associated with postoperative hematoma is a big one. So 
it, as you analyze the factors, are there papers, there probably have been papers looking at what's the surgeon factor in here? I mean, is, uh, is infection varying widely between different surgeons or between different institutions? And so this is, I, I think, I don't know, I would look to this as maybe one of the biggest factors that needs to be controlled through education, through technique, through control of hematoma, maybe even bigger than these A1C factors or uh, uh, milieu, the patient milieu factors. Joel, that's an amazing uh, um, comment. 100% agree with you in that surgical factors play a major, major role. Yeah. So the CDC talks about this conceptual formula the bio burden versus the immune threshold of the host. And if that bio burden reaches above the immune threshold, the clinical manifestation of infections. So the bio burden is, you know, give them antibiotics, uh, reduce your operative time, don't handle the soft tissues too much, do expeditious surgery, reduce blood loss, you know, the list goes on, right? And on top of that, control their nutritional status, hemoglobin A1C, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you agree that all of those play a role in that bio burden. Yeah, of course, and, yeah. And then the immune side, you know, give them nutritional supplement, make sure their vitamin D levels are okay, stop the, you know, the immune um, modulating biologicals, et cetera. So your point is a very valid one, and I think something that like master surgeons like you need to talk more about in that Doing a hip replacement in two and a half hours, not giving tranexamic acid, not administering dose-based antibiotics, is definitely going to have a, and by the way, giving them aggressive anticoagulation, which is a subject for the next talk. And thank you for uh, talking about hematoma because that sets us up for the next thing. And that is reduction of blood loss and hematoma formation, for example, is going to make a difference. So there are surgeons Yes, to, uh, to answer your question, look at the British Registry. Now they actually have the surgeons' names in the British Registry. The re incidence of infection from one surgeon to another varies by about 18 to 20-fold. I was looking at it last week. 18 and to 20-fold? 20-fold difference. Okay, well, this is a huge There's thing There's a to surgeon that has 0.1% and another, per another surgeon that has 1.9%. Now, you might say that surgeon is operating on higher risk patients, et cetera. I agree, I mean, there are surgeons who operate on very, very complicated cases. But then again, I think it was Bo that just said earlier, you know, one day in somebody else's OR is worth 20 days in your own. I have visited places where you go to these ORs and you watch these surgeons. And I was part of this volunteer organization called AMF. We go to these places where their infection rate's 20% and you're looking to see what is the reason that their infection rate is 20%, it's not a, there's never a single smoking gun. It is the combination of things. The surgeon doesn't pay attention to draping. The antibiotic is not weight-based, and then the list goes on. So, yeah, there, so the question is, should those surgeons with, you know, 4 or 5% infection rate after a primary should go back and get, like, a training on infection prevention? Perhaps, perhaps they should. But I agree with the hematoma though. I think we will talk about that later. Thank you, Joel. One last question maybe. The, with the new next uh, generation sequencing techniques, what do you think uh, is the role for re-aspirating if you do choose to do a two-stage and how long would you do a drug holiday if you felt that that was valuable? Yeah, so uh, again, I'm conflicted, but there's something called the ortho key. What I do is I put the synovial fluid in a kit and I send it out to Marcogen DX. It's a $200 test. They will do cell count, neutrophil differential, serum, uh, cell uh, synovial biomarker, and then they will do the full uh, sequencing for DNA. And then you get the result back. It says high probability of infection, this patient also had 20, 30% DNA of C acnes. That one, I will treat, for sure. Then we did exactly the same thing on reimplantation, And you can send samples of um, tissue as well. And on the reimplantation, about 18% of the samples that we'd sent for next generation sequencing had a signal of an organism. We published a paper showing that if a culture from reimplantation is positive, the likelihood of failure of a reimplantation in that patient was 24 folds higher. So positive culture. The question is, does it also apply to NGS? 
The answer is yes. Based on that 2,000 samples we had, we had 274 patients that failed a second uh, two-stage exchange, looked at the signal, every single one of them had a positive NGS signal. Now, there were some that didn't fail and had an NGS signal also, but that might explain why Craig De La Valle's work on showing that three months of suppressive antibiotic therapy after reimplantation reduced the infection rate. So I do that now, and if the, if the NGS signal from reimplantation is positive, I would treat them orally. Not necessarily intravenously, but orally. I would treat them. But would you aspirate them before you take them to surgery? No, I do them in, during the surgery. I rarely ever do like another space or exchange. During that time, I just sort of do everything thinking that they are still infected, but take that uh, NGS signal, and if that NGS signal is positive, then I would treat them. Thank you very much.